Good day, everybody. Welcome to another session of Pulp Tutorials. Today, we begin our series on international financial reporting standards. And then we want to begin with um, the standard on non-current assets for tangible. That is the IES system. And so today, we are going to look at property, plant, and equipment. So IES 16, PPE, property, plant, and equipment. Property, plant, and equipment. All right. Now, I want you to understand something when it comes to this particular standard. Now, this is a standard for non-current assets. Now, I want to show you a particular breakdown of non-current assets. Now, non-current assets, we say that they are assets that has more than one year of economic life to the business, and then it's useful. Now, there are some standards that are regulating this non-current asset. Now, first of all, you have to understand that there are two broad classifications when it comes to whether it's tangible or not. We have tangible non-current assets, and then we have the intangibles. All right, so some of the non-current assets are tangible, others are intangible. Now, when it comes to the tangible non-current assets, okay, now, there, there is a standard that regulates the intangible non-current assets, and that is the IES 38. Okay, that one is for intangible assets. Now, when it comes to the tangible asset, there is another standard, but then it depends on the purpose or the use of the tangible non-current assets. Some of the tangible non-current assets are used by the business ourselves to generate revenue for ourselves. So we use them to generate revenue. And some of them are given out as rentals so that we can earn rent income from them. And so the IFRS has separated two different standards so that one will cater for the non-current assets, tangible non-current assets that are being used by the business. And another standard to cater for that that is being used for rental or to earn rental income. And so the one that are being used by the business is called PPE, that is property, plant, and equipment. And then the one that are being used or we give out as rent for rental income is called investment property. All right, and so the standard that regulates the property, plant, and equipment is IAS 16. And the standard that regulates the investment property is IAS 40. And then the intangible non-current assets are being regulated by IES 38. So these are three different standards, all for non-current assets. And so when we talk about IES 16, IES 16 is limited to only tangible non-current assets that are being used by the business for our own um, um, benefit, economic benefit. And so what is property, plant, and equipment, or PPE? IES 16, the scope of IES 16 is that the standard serves as a guide for us to know how to treat non-current assets that are tangible and that are being used by the business ourselves to generate revenue. So that if there is a non-current asset that is being used or that is being given out as a rental property, even though it's a physical, a tangible non-current asset, it does not form part of PPE except it is being used by the business itself to generate revenue. All right. And so these are the dynamics of the scope of the non-current assets uh, of the property, plant, and equipment, sorry. And so, having understood this, then we want to understand, so it is the property, plant, and uh, equipment. This is the professional name that has been given, a professional name that has been given for non current assets that are tangible and that are being used by the business to generate revenue. And so what is property, plant, and equipment? Again, property, plant, and equipment are tangible non-current assets that are being used by the business to generate revenue. And so there is always a temptation, especially when we are preparing uh, published accounts for companies and we have to prepare a property, plant, and equipment schedule. There is a temptation on the part of professional students writing the, either the ACCA or ICAJ Ghana. Those, mo most of the time, people are tempted to pick investment property as part of the PPE schedule. And that is why I took my time to explain that if the non-current asset is not being used by the business, it does not form part of 
the property plant and equipment. Okay, so IS 16 property plant and equipment does not apply. It does not apply to biological assets. So take note that biological assets are not covered under IS 16. And also mineral rights and reserves are also not covered by the IAS system. And so whenever we are looking at IAS system, we exclude these two because they are covered by other financial reporting standards. Okay. And so we look at some basic definitions under IAS system. So there are some basic terms that we should be conversant with as far as the IAS system is concerned. And the first one is cost. What is cost? What is cost? Cost refers to the amount of consideration paid or the fair value that is incurred in exchange for the non-current assets. And so when we buy a non-current asset, the amount of consideration that we pay out, including all other direct costs that are incurred in bringing the asset to its useful state, is called cost. And we will come back to the components of cost and then we will look at it into detail. And so let me just take my time on cost. And the next thing I want to talk about is residual value. Residual value. Now, residual value, or what some others we call it scrap value, is the value at which the asset will be sold at the end of its useful life. The value at which the asset could be sold at the end of its useful life. That is the residual value. And so when we want to look at depreciation, especially we consider the residual value. And also, we want to look at fair value. Fair value. Now, when we say the fair value of an asset or a property, plant, and equipment, we are talking about the amount at which the asset could be exchanged between knowledgeable and willing parties in an arm's length transaction. That is the standard definition. And so, we look at the amount at which we can exchange the, the asset between ourselves when there is a, the market is an efficient market. Because an efficient market is a market that, that has information. And so when the market is efficient, usually there are no cheating in the market. And that is why we say that the value is fair because the cheat is not there. And so the value at which an asset will be uh, transferred between knowledgeable and willing parties in an arm's length transaction is what we call fair value of an asset. Okay, so the next thing that I want to also explain is what we call entity specific value or we call it the value in use. So you either see it as entity specific value or value in use. Now what is the meaning of entity specific value? Now. The entity spe specific value of the asset is the, we are, we are looking at a projection, okay? And so if we continue to use the asset and do not sell it, we expect that the non-current asset will let some income flow into the business. It will generate revenue for the business or the organization. And so we will look at if we have 10 years useful life ahead of us to use the non-current asset, we estimate the cash flows that will be coming into the business for all the 10 years, and then we add all of them up. And when we add all of them up, we know the total cash flows that are going to come into the business as a continuous use of the assets, okay? And so we also take into consideration the time value of money. And so what we do is that there is a discounting of the future cash flows into today's terms. So we look at the present value of the cash flows that are going to be generated from the continuous use of the assets into today's terms. And so when we want to talk about the entity specific value, we will say that it is the present value of the expected cash flows that, are so, that is supposed to be generated by the business from the continuous use of the asset. That is basically what this value in use is about. And so we look at the combined revenue that we will get into the future from the continuous use of the asset taking the present value of the totals year by year and then we add them up. That is basically what we call the value in use for the non-current asset. 
Okay, for the non-current asset. And then also, we look at the current amount. The current amount. The current amount of the asset. Now, the current amount is basically what we call the net book value. So maybe you are very familiar with what we call NBV or net book value or net. So the net book value or the current amount basically is the cost of the asset less its accumulated depreciation and any accumulated impairment losses. And so we will come to impairment into detail. So that, that is basically what the current amount is. Cost minus accumulated depreciation minus accumulated impairment losses. Then we get the carrying amount. And the carrying amount means that that is the amount that we are carrying onto the statement of financial position in respect of the item of PPE. And then also, finally, last but not the least, I want to look at what we call impairment or impairment loss. Now, impairment loss. Impairment loss simply has to do with the amount at which um, the carrying amount of an asset exceeds its recoverable amount. And what do I mean by recoverable amount? We are going to look at this into detail when we are treating IES 36, which is a standard that takes care for impairment. And so the amount at which uh, the carrying amount exceeds its recoverable amount, or you can simply say that carrying amount minus recoverable amount, when the difference is positive, it's an impairment loss. But when the difference is negative, we maintain the carrying amount value in the financial statement because of the prudence concept. We don't want to anticipate future profits. We just want to anticipate losses alone. All right, so there is nothing like an impairment gain as far as the IFRS is concerned. So we are going to look at recognition and measurement of PPE. How do we recognize and how do we measure the property plant and equipment? And we want to start with recognition. So recognition of PPE. Now, what is recognition? Recognition, professionally, recognition has to do with the incorporation of property, plants, and equipment into the financial statement. So we are incorporating the PPE to the financial statement. That means we are recognizing it. That is basically what recognition is about. It's about incorporation. Okay. So once you are incorporating, we say we are recognizing. When you are asked to explain recognition, is incorporation of the PPE to the financial statements. Now, what is the criteria for recognition? We have a criteria for recognition. We don't just recognize anything. Just because um, there, there is an asset, we just recognize it. No. There should be a criteria for recognition. And so we are looking at the recognition criteria. Now, the recognition criteria. Now, there are two criteria that we, there, there are basically two that must be present before we recognize the asset. And the first one is that one, there should be a probability that future economic benefits will flow to the entity from the continuous use of the asset. So that is the first criteria, that, that, that uh, it is probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity from the continuous use of the asset. And the second criteria is that the cost of the PPE can be measured reliably. That is the second one. And so if you have, an, you, you have something that you call an asset or, or a tangible asset that you are using and then you cannot measure the cost reliably. You are finding it difficult to know the cost. Then of course you cannot recognize it. And then if it is, there is no probability that it will bring a future economic benefit to the entity, you cannot recognize. So this is the criteria for recognizing of the, the PPE values. So one, it is probable that future economic benefits will flow to the entity from the continuous use of the asset. And two, the cost of the PPE can be measured reliably. All right, so that is the recognition criteria. And then we look at measurement. So what is measurement? Measurement of PPE. So what is measurement? Measurement simply means that you are assigning values to the PPE. And so once you are able to estimate the cost and whatever model that you are using, you are assigning value to the asset so that you will incorporate it. And then you cannot recognize an asset when you don't, it doesn't have a value. What, value. what value are you going to give it away? 
or you're going to give to it in the financial statement. And so measurement of PPE is simply assigning of values to the asset for recognition. All right, so we measure and then we recognize. So that is basically how recognition and measurement moves together. Now, there are two different recognition um, methods. Or we have measurement at initial recognition, let me say that. And then we have measurement subsequent to initial recognition. So at initial recognition, we should measure it. And then subsequent recognitions as well. So we have one measurement that is at initial recognition, and then we have measurement that is subsequent to initial recognition. So these are the two different type times that we do measurements. We can measure at initial recognition, and then we can measure subsequently year by year. Okay, and so now. There are some models that we use to recognize or to measure. Now, when we are doing measurement at initial recognition, we don't have any option than to go by the cost. Than to go by, than to go by the cost because once you buy the asset, you know the cost of the asset that you have acquired. And that at that time, that is the initial stage. And so the only value that you reasonably assign to the PP is the cost. And so when you pick the cost, you just if you the cost is ten thousand CDs and the item is let's say building, you just go to the financial statement building, you put ten thousand as a value, and that is how you measure it at cost. And so at initial recognition, we measure by cost alone. And so the cost model, we call it the cost model, is always used at initial recognition. Now when we come to subsequent recognition. That is year after year when we have depreciated the asset and the asset is being used throughout its useful life. We have two me methods that we can go. We can still maintain the cost model. We can still maintain the cost model, or we go by the revaluation model. So the revaluation model comes in when there is a subsequent. Uh, measurement, uh, subsequent recognition. Okay, so when there is initial recognition, we go by the cost model, we measure at cost, but during subsequent recognitions, we look at going either the cost way or the revaluation model. And then I'm going to take my time to explain both models and then you will understand them and apply them in your calculations. Okay, so we are going to look at both models, the cost model and the revaluation model. And so I want to begin with the cost model. And so with the cost model, the first and the most important part of it that we should look at is the components of cost. What goes into cost? And that is why I told you earlier that cost has a lot of components. So when we talk about cost of an asset, it's not just the purchase price. There are other things that add up to cost. And so, components of cost. What are the components of cost? The first component of cost, obviously, is the purchase price. So, once you buy a non-current asset, the purchase price itself is part of the cost of the asset. But let's remember that sometimes we have trade discounts. And so, when there is a discount or a rebate, obviously, we have to take it out before we measure the cost. And so if we bought an item for 10,000 CDs and then there is a discount of 1,000, then of course the purchase up paid 9,000. That is the difference. And so 9,000 is the cost that we are going to measure, recognize, not the 10,000. And so the purchase price should be less any trade discount or rebate. All right. So. The first component of cost is the purchase price minus trade discount, any possible trade discount. All right. And then the second component of cost is import duties plus direct taxes. So when there is an import duty, let's say the thing was shipped from overseas and you pay a duty, the duty or the direct tax you are paying on any purchase of non-current assets is part of the cost of the non-current asset. And so 
The second component, of course, is import duties and any direct tax, okay, that you, you, you pay in connection to the assets. And then the third component, of course, has to do with any, we say that any cost incurred directly in bringing the asset into its useful state, any cost incurred directly in bringing the asset into its useful state. So, before we look at the total cost of an asset, it's not just about the purchase price. I said that the purchase price should be there. If there are any direct taxes, it is part of the cost. So if you bought the thing for 10,000 and you pay tax of 13,000, uh, of 3,000, sorry, then your, pay, your cost is 13,000, you add it up. Then if there is any cost that you incurred, and it is a direct cost of bringing the asset into its useful state. For example, if you buy a computer or system equipment and you bring it into your office, you cannot just use the machine. You, you may need an expert to come and set up the machine and make sure that it is working. Okay, so once the thing has not reached its useful state, you bought it but it's not useful yet, then you cannot say that uh, you are done with your cost in carrying. So if you buy a vehicle and you may need an expert to do road testing for you and to make sure that it is in good condition before you begin to use the cost of the road testing that you pay to that professional mechanic is part of your cost. And so there are so many direct attributable costs that you incur to bring the asset into its useful state. And one of those costs is cost of site preparation. We can talk about professional fees. We can talk about testing fees. We can talk about uh, uh, this architecture design fees and any other thing that you need to prepare the asset to its useful state. Then it is also part of cost. So initial delivery and handling cost is also there and all those costs that are directly. So when you get any question, and we are going to solve practical questions, you look at uh, the, 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 what the professional exams actually would, would do is that when you are supposed to calculate the components of cost, they will give you some costs that you incur and some expenses that you made. And then you will be asked to list and calculate your total cost. Some of the items will be part of cost. Some of them will just be there. They will not be part of cost, just to confuse you. It is your responsibility to identify which ones are part of cost and which ones are not part. And normally where the main issue of challenge comes is when it comes to the point three. When the students will be able to differentiate which costs are directly attributable and which costs are not. So that is the, the challenge. And so we will spend some time there. All right. And then the last thing that we will, we will talk about is an unavoidable cost of dismantling and restoration of the site at the end of the useful life of the asset. The initial estimate of an unavoidable cost of dismantling at the end of the useful life of the asset. For example, if you are setting up a plant on a land to be used for 20 years, the useful life of the plant is 20 years. Now, after the useful life of the plant, you need to restore the land to its useful original state by dismantling the plant from the land. And what we are going to do is that we are not going to dis dismantle that plant for free. We will pay some money or we will incur some expenses or cost for that. And so what we are going to do is that at the beginning of the useful life of the plant, we estimate that in 20 years time, if I want to dismantle this property and then restore the land, how much will I incur in, in terms of cost before I can dismantle? So when we are able to do that estimation that, okay, in 20 years after the useful life, I'll have to pay 10,000 to restore the land and to dismantle, then that 10,000 that will be incurred in 20 years should be part of cost of the plant in today. So that when we are recognizing the plant, we will add that 10,000 to the cost today. And that is basically what we are talking about. And so we say that initial estimate of unavoidable uh, cost of dismantling and restoration of site. All right, so basically, this is 
the four points that we look at the estimates of an unavoidable cost we cannot avoid. It's not an avoidable cost. Whether you like it or not, you incur in the future. And so it is a relevant cost. And so it is part of the cost of the non current asset. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the four main components of cost. But I told you, and I want to repeat again, that the third one is the most challenging. Maybe you have a problem with solving questions in connection with components of cost. But I want you to take your time and understand the third point very well. Once you are able to understand the third point very well, I believe your problem will be solved. Because the first one is obvious. Everyone will know that purchase price is part of the cost. Even those who have never done accounting before. But when it comes to import duties, it's not difficult to remember that import duties and direct taxes are part of cost. When we, it comes to the uh, estimation of the future unavoidable cost of dismantling, those ones, it's a unique thing that you always remember most likely. And when it comes to the other costs that are directly attributable, yeah, the other direct attributable costs, those ones can be many. Those ones are not specific. And to help you again, I will start by saying that cost of site preparation is one of them. Then testing, initial testing of the asset is one of them. Then the fees you pay to the professional for testing is also one of them. So th there are some fees that, or there are costs that you, if you don't incur them, the asset will not be ready for use. And that is what I mean. You need to incur them before you use it. So try and differentiate. They will bring in other costs. But if your judgment tells you that for this cost, whether we incur it or not, we can start using the asset, then this is not part of the point three. This point three means that we cannot use the asset except we incur them. And they are many, and they can come in different forms. And so once you see them, it comes back to your judgment that is this cost a uh, uh, cost that I have to incur before I start using the asset, then that cost will be part of the cost of the non total cost of the non current asset or PP. Okay, so this is basically the components of cost. So now we are going to look at we have looked at the components of cost. So we are going to look at uh, those that are not part of the components of course. When you see them, you, they are there to confuse you. Don't add them. So I would say exclusions from the components of cost. Of course, we are looking at exclusions. Now, remember that I told you that there are some costs that are directly attributed in bringing the asset into its useful state. Now, so those costs, like testing of the asset itself, is part of the components of cost. But after the asset has been tested, and then we are starting operations with it, we can have some pre-production cost by ourselves. This one, the expert is gone, and we are having a startup, and maybe we, we do first batch of production for test or something. And those ones are not the testing of the asset. We call them startup cost and pre-production cost. Those ones are not part of the cost of the PPE, because the PPE has been set and ready for use before we started. I told you that those costs must be inevitable. We should the cost that should be part of PPE should be costs that we cannot do without, except we cannot start the asset except we incur them. Start using the asset except we incur. But now we are saying that these ones there, they are costs that the asset has been made ready, and then we can use it. But we ourselves decide that okay, let's give ourselves some time. Let's not start the production, but let's do, do some pre-production things with the machine on our own. And so we call them startup costs or pre-production costs. And this one is not, I repeat, not part of the PPE. So don't be tempted when you see a question and they can try to trick you by making it similar to what will be part. This is a startup cost and pre-production cost. It's not part of the cost of PPE. And then also administrative overhead. Administrative and general overhead. Are not part of cost because normally they are of indirect nature. So these are indirect costs. Now the Administrative overheads, general overheads are not part of the cost of PP. So when you are reading a question and you see administrative overhead incurred was this amount, don't be tempted to add it to your cost calculation. And then finally, um, I will say that. Oh, 
And then finally, um, we also want to look at initial operating loss. Initial operating losses. Now, when we start production, at the beginning, we may start making some losses. Please, the losses that we make at the beginning of production is not part of the component of cost. For this one, I don't think that it's a tempting, it's very tempting to take it because it's clear that once you are making a loss, you have started production. Why do you add it to your cost? So let's take note that initial operating losses are also not part. So these three components here are not part of cost. We have talked about four basic components of cost and we have also seen three items that are not part of the components of cost. Okay, and so we are going to take we are going to take a question and then we are going to look at how to identify the components of cost. I want us to take a look at a question on components of cost and let's see how we have enhanced our understanding. You have just been appointed as a financial accountant of Odamia Pia Company Limited. On 1st January 2011, Odamia Pia Company acquired a production equipment with a list price of 250000 The following costs were further incurred. Delivery, 18000 Installation, 24000 General administrative cost of indirect nature, 3000 The installation and setting up period took three months, and a further amount of 21000 was spent on costs directly related to bringing the asset to its working condition. The equipment was ready for use on 1st April 2011. Monthly managerial reports indicated that for the first five months, the production units from the equipment resulted in an initial operating loss of 15,000 because of small quantities produced. The months thereafter show much more positive results. The equipment has an estimated useful life of 10 years an estimated residual value of 18000 The estimated dismantling cost amount to 12000 required. What is the cost of the assets to be initially recognized in the PP register? And what amount should be charged in the income statement relating to the consumption of economic benefits embodied in the asset for the 2011 financial year? And so we have been asked to calculate the cost and the depreciation for the 2011 financial year for Odami Apia Company Limited. Okay, now, looking at the question, it's just like I told you, whatever they will say is that they will give you a list of items and then you will tell which one will be part of cost or which one will not be part. Now, you're saying that they purchased an equipment on 1st January 2011. Now, the cost of the equipment is 250000 Okay, so, uh, sorry, the purchase price is 250000 And so, what we, 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 what we are going to do is that as we continue to read ahead, let's identify which ones will be part and which ones will not be part of cost. That is a simple way to go about it. So, reading from top to down again, we are going to identify which ones will be part and which ones will not be part of cost. So we're starting looking at the list price of 250000 Definitely, that one will be part of cost because that is the purchase price. Then there is a delivery cost of 18000 which obviously is also part of the component of cost. Installation cost of 24000 will also be part of the component of cost. It's part. Then what about general administrative cost of indirect nature? They've even added that. So it means that that 3000 will not be part of our component of cost. Then we are told that for a period of three months, other costs that was directly attributable to bring the asset into its useful state was incurred. And that is 21000 And that one is a direct cost. 
we are fortunate that they have stamped, they have stamped them all up for us as 21,000. And so that is part of the component of cost. Then we also saw that there were some operating losses for the first five months. And like we said, that, that is an exclusion to cost. We are not going to add the losses that were incurred. Then there was a residual value of 18,000. The residual value will also not be added to the component of cost because the purpose of the residual value is for the calculation of the depreciation. And then finally, there was an estimated dismantling cost of 12,000, which yes, will be part of the component of cost. And so it's a very simple question. Forget about how long they narrated it. These are the points that I have just picked it out for you. And so we are going to solve this question together. Okay, and so we will see Odame Company Limited. Odame Apia Company Limited. Then we will see components of cost. Then we will bring our currency sign. Okay, and so we begin. This is the outline. We are just going to list which ones will be there and which ones will not be there. And so we will bring our purchase price because we cannot exclude that, obviously. And that is 250000 There was no trade discount. And so we will bring the full amount. If there was a trade discount, then we would have taken out the trade discount from the purchase price and then bring the final figure here. Remember. And then there was a delivery cost of 24,000 Ghana cities. And so that is part of cost. And then the question also made mention of installation cost. So installation cost will also be there. Sorry, the delivery was 18,000. And then installation is 24,000. Okay. And then there was a general administrative expenses, uh, administrative overhead which I told you is indirect and will not appear. So that one is just there to, for confusion. Don't add them. Okay. And then going forward, we also saw that the question says that there was other attributable cost of 20,000. So those are direct cost attributable, 21,000, of which we are supposed to add because it's part of the components of cost. Then there was an operating loss of 15,000, which also will not be added. Remember that I told you that the losses are not part. Then there was a residual value of 18,000. And the residual value, I told you, the purpose is for the calculation of depreciation. Don't be tempted to add it to the components of cost. Finally, there was an estimated dismantling cost, which was part of the components of cost that we learned earlier. And so the estimated dismantling cost will be there. So estimated cost of dismantling. That is 12,000 Ghana cities. And so we add this up and then we have our component of cost to be 325,000 Ghana cities. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the first part of the question. As simple as ABC to get a component of cost. You just have to tell which ones will be part and which ones will be excluded. Okay, so that is basically it. And then the second requirement is that we should calculate depreciation charge. They didn't make mention of depreciation. They said that they calculate what amount should be charged in the income statement relating to the consumption of economic benefits embodied in the asset for the 2011 financial year. And so we are, this is part A. And then for the part B, we look at the depreciation charge for the year. And the depreciation charge for the year, the formula is basically our cost minus residual value over the estimated useful life. And this is what we are going to use to calculate our depreciation charge. Okay, so, so what we are going to do is that we are going to, the cost that we have just identified is 325,000 Ghana CD. The residual value given to us is 18,000 Ghana cities. And then 
the estimated useful life from the question is 10 years. And so what we are going to do is that this is what is supposed to be the depreciation charge for the year. Now there was something very important to the question that I want to draw your attention to. So this is the formula for depreciation charge. Okay, so we are going to calculate depreciation based on the information we have for this formula. And so for depreciation charge for 2011, it's going to be our cost, which is the 325,000 uh, CDs minus the residual value that was given of 18,000 all over the useful life of 10 years. This should be our depreciation charge. But then, remember that there is an important part of the question that I didn't really highlight. We were told that the equipment was ready for use on 1st April 2011. Equipment was ready for use on 1st April. Now it tells us that the equipment was used from April to December, and that is 9 months, not all the 12 months. And this is depreciation charge per annum. So we cannot use per annum when we had only 9 months. Of course, there should be a one month ownership basis calculation here. So what we are going to do is that whatever that we have done, we are going to multiply it by 9 over 12 months so that we can have the true reflection. But we cannot depreciate the asset that we have not used. You know, depreciation has to do with the consumption of economic benefit from the use of the asset. But if you have not used it, you don't consume any benefit. And so first three months, there was no consumption. And that is why I have limited it to 9 over 12. And so when we do this, then our depreciation charge for 2011 will be 23,025 Ghana cities. And ladies and gentlemen, this will be our final answer for the question. Alright. Okay, so this brings us to part 1 of IES 16. Now, watch out for the next video. We are going to have a part 2 of this same standard where we are going to look at the other uh, models like the revaluation model and then we'll look at the review of economic useful life and the disclosures that are related to PP. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you.